Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about the numerical grain of physical quantities. And so this is kind of a, so Matilda gave this very nice uh, distinction at the beginning of her talk, separating quantities in the physical world from uh, kind of the numerical representations of quantities in the physical world, uh, insofar as biological organisms are capable of representing numerical quantities and, and perceiving them and being aware of them. I'm kind of going to focus on the other side of things. So if we take seriously the notion that physical uh, things in the world actually instantiate certain quantities, uh, to what extent can we talk about the kinds of number systems that uh, in which quantities take their values? So uh, the first thing to say, this just a disclaimer, I'm gonna leave out a fair number of formal details here and just try and focus on the conceptually salient points. There's a lot of like formal logic that's going on in the background here and I'm happy to talk about that more. Um, but yeah, I'm just gonna try and make this something that can be followed. Uh, the other thing is this is a work in progress and it's kind of attached to a larger uh, program of research. So I, I, I am certainly not, uh, claiming to have solved all these problems, but I'd, I'd be uh, most interested in hearing any feedback that you guys might have. So let's get into this. Um, a bit of a motivating question, uh, how tall am I? Right, this is a reasonable kind of question that somebody could ask. Uh, to put it in a more suggestive, although linguistically cumbersome way, we might instead say, well, what is the numerical value that the physical quantity height has uh, uh, when determined for the physical object called me. So we've got some object in the world, we believe it to instantiate a quantity called height, uh, and then we're querying the world, trying to figure out what the value of that, of that property is. Um, so this is kind of the view that I'm going to adopt for quantities. Uh, the general way to go about this is saying, well, we talk about a class of objects in the world that uh, have some certain quantity with a determinate value. Uh, I'm putting aside all issues of metaphysical indeterminacy because those get very complicated. So forget about quantum mechanics for a second and stuff like that. Um, but suppose we've got these, these objects in the world, they, they have these uh, quantities, those quantities take on values. So height, for instance, may be thought of as a function H that takes in objects and outputs values in some number system. So the question that I kind of want to get at is, well, what's the correct choice of number system for quantities? Uh, so like in the example of height, we typically think of height as being real valued. You know, my height is going to be a, 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 in the appropriate units, it's going to be some real value. And we uh, classically, the sort of received view is that all of those uncountably infinite uh, many digits that would be required in order to fully encode a real number, we think that all of those somehow track some feature of reality. Um, okay, so that's the, the way that we talk about height as a property and the way we talk about a lot of uh, physical quantities. Uh, is this number system, like the, the real numbers, is this somehow a fundamental uh, feature of the world or uh, the feature of these quantities? Or is this merely a convention that we adopt when we try to represent the world using our theories? Um, and then a follow-up question to that is, well, if there is some kind of fundamental uh, numerical system that, that is, I guess, best suited to representing quantities in the world, why do we take it typically to be the real numbers and not say the rational numbers or the hyper real numbers or some other number system that has some wildly large infinite cardinality or something like that? Um, so why do, we, why do we pick the reals when there seem to be other kinds of options uh, on offer? Uh, so the particular question I want to try to address here in this talk is, do physical quantities actually have a fundamental numerical resolution? So uh, when I talk about numerical resolution, I'm here referring to kind of the size and order structure of the underlying number system in which a quantity takes its value. So is there something fundamental about the number system in which a quantity takes its value that somehow latches onto the structure of reality, or is this merely a convention? And the answer that I'm going to propose and hopefully convince you of is that there actually is usually no fundamental resolution for physical quantities. So there usually is no uh, fundamental nature to the number systems in which we think physical quantities take their values. Uh, to be a bit more specific, what I'm gonna try and argue for is twofold. The first thing I wanna say is that physical quantities only have a fundamental resolution in, in a theory if the structure of the theory alone 
contains enough information to uniquely determine the relevant number system. So if by looking at my scientific theory about height, there's enough structure for me to uh, pick out the, the number system that height takes its value and as being the real numbers, then the real numbers are uh, the fundamental numerical grain of height. That, that's kind of the, the notion I, I want to adopt here. And my claim is that on a syntactic account of theories, which I'll spell out in a moment, there can essentially never be enough structural information in order to make these number systems uh, uniquely determined in this way. So in, in that sense, there can never be any fundamental numerical resolution to physical quantities. All right, so just a bit of a roadmap for how I'm gonna get there. Uh, first thing that's required is kind of a, we first need to settle on a common language for talking about scientific theories. And there's massive debate in philosophy of science about the best way to do this. And I'm going to give a fairly oversimplified version of this, uh, but I'm going to adopt a particular view about theories called the syntactic view of theories. Then I'm going to spell out a few kind of background notions from, from modern logic, particularly from model theory, uh, and I'm going to roughly sketch a thing called the lowenheim skolem theorem. And then I'm going to use this theorem to do a bunch of legwork for me uh, to argue that, that quantities do not have a fundamental numerical resolution. And the way that I'm going to do that is basically by construing quantities in an operational way, uh, such that you can deploy the tools of model theory to understanding them. Uh, and then the lohenheim skolem theorem will allow us to conclude that there is no unique number system compatible with any sort of operational characterization of a quantity. Right, so that's the roadmap. Let's see how this goes. First thing, uh, when we try to talk about theories in kind of a philosophical context, philosophers of science have argued for many decades about what the proper kind of logical objects uh, scientific theories actually are. So. Um, if someone just asks you, what's the logical structure of a scientific theory? Uh, there are many different kinds of answers that you could give. Typically, those answers are going to fall into one of two categories. Uh, the first view, which is sort of the historical successor, the sort of historical uh, follow-up to the logical positivist program, is this uh, so-called semantic account of theories. And on the semantic account, a scientific theory is a collection of models that have certain properties. So uh, if I'm looking at, for instance, classical mechanics, the theory of classical mechanics for the semanticist is going to be a collection of systems in the world that behave in a way that looks like classical mechanics. So the emphasis is being put on the models here. Uh, now, the syntactic account is kind of the uh, dialectical rebuttal to the semantic account. And on the syntactic account of theories, uh, philosophers say that a scientific theory is actually a collection of axioms over some formal language. Now, axioms have models, so there's a derived notion of models that come out of a syntactic view of theories, but the syntacticist really wants to drive home the idea that the axioms are the constitutive feature of a scientific theory. Axioms encode things like the laws of nature, um, the structure of, of physical entities and the structure of the world, that kind of stuff. Um, and then models are merely incidental uh, instances of those uh, general rules. So the syntacticist really puts the onus on the axioms themselves. So in this sense, a theory for the syntacticist is literally like a logical theory of, of axioms. Now, uh, there's an extensive debate about this stuff. This is a, a very thick literature, and but and I'm gonna only give part of it, of course, but basically I'm going to adopt the syntactic view. And, and here's a rough sketch of why. Um, so for, for the semantic view of theories to be well posed, one first requires uh, a means for describing the properties of models, right? If, if a theory is a bunch of models with certain properties, you need to be able to make the notion of properties precise. Now, mathematically, the way that we do this is by showing that all of those models satisfy certain axioms in a formal language. So in order for a semantic view of theories to be well posed, you really require some sort of syntactic import at the beginning. Uh, moreover, given a collection of axioms, we're still perfectly warranted in talking about the models that satisfy those axioms as kind of a derived concept. So because of this, the syntactic view is on the one hand better posed and on the other hand, more expressive than the semantic view. Uh, at least that's a rough characterization. So for these reasons, I'm going to adopt a syntactic view of theories. 
Now, in contemporary philosophy of science, there's actually a category theoretic account of all of this stuff that kind of unifies some of the, the pros of both of these views. Um, I'm just going to set that aside entirely. Uh, okay, so, so we're going to adopt this syntactic view of theories. I'm gonna spell this out in a little bit more formal detail. So I hope you guys all stay with me here, but the idea is, uh, okay, imagine some logical framework. This, now there's many different logical frameworks. This could be first order predicate logic. This could be propositional logic. This could be intuitionistic logic. There's many different kinds of logical frameworks. So I'm not going to commit to any in particular, although typically we'll require it to be quantified in some way. Um, so in a logical framework, we start by talking about a logical signature. So signature sigma, is a set of symbols that denote things like predicates, functions, constants, stuff like that. But they're really just symbols. And then a sentence within a particular logical framework over uh, uh, that signature is just a string of logical symbols and sig symbols in the signature that are somehow grammatically well formed by the grammatical rules of the logical framework in question. Now, on the syntactic view of theories, a theory is a collection of sentences. So a collection of these well-formed logical strings uh, that are taken to be true, so they're axioms. Now, as an example of this, we might think of the theory of partial orders. So uh, in the theory of partial orders, we take a signature that has one ordering relation as its, its only additional symbol. Uh, and then the theory of partial orders is given by these three axioms that basically say this order relation is reflexive, it's anti-symmetric, and it's transitive. So th that's the theory of partial orders. The theory is given by the axioms. Now there's models of, of the theory, uh, but the theory itself is given by the axioms and that's the syntactic view. Now, once we have a notion of a, of a class of uh, axioms in place, the natural step is to start talking about models of those axioms. Now, there's a lot of mathematical work that goes into defining models and I'm gonna brush over all of it. Uh, so this is a very, a very simplified view of model theory, but basically the idea is if you fix some sort of language, some signature, then you can talk about structures over that signature. And a structure is just a collection of objects uh, for which the symbols in the signature may be interpreted as structural features. So for a formula phi, uh, a sigma structure M is called a model of phi. If upon interpreting the symbols of the, of the signature as structural features of M, phi is true of M. So models are, uh, so a model of an axiom is basically a collection of objects that has some sort of structure where the structure of that collection of objects obeys the uh, sort of intuitive interpretations of the axioms. Now there's a mathematical way to make that precise, but that's roughly the idea of what it means to be a model of some axioms. And then the size of a model is given by its cardinality, so the number of objects that it has. And as an example, to relate this back to partial orders, just so that you kind of get comfortable with these ideas, if you consider a set of people, P, that are structured by like a genealogical relation in which A is less than B, if and only if A is one of B's ancestors, then you can show that this, uh, this structure uh, is a model of the theory of partial orders if one interprets this genealogical relation as a uh, as being the partial order relation from the theory of partial orders. So we can see that this is one instance of a model of the theory of partial orders. There's many other uh, models of the theory of partial orders. Uh, for instance, uh, in special relativity, the ordering of space-time events by their causal relations would be another instance of a partial order. So the theory is very general and it can apply to many different kinds of models. Right, uh, in a physical context, uh, another uh, a kind of an example of this would be to look at classical mechanics. Now, classical mechanics is typically construed as uh, uh, using Hamil Hamiltonian mechanics. And Hamiltonian mechanics is basically just a theory that says all physical objects uh, obey certain equations called Hamilton's equations. So in this setting, Hamilton's equations become the constitutive axioms that define the theory in a syntactic manner. And then a model of this theory would be any collection of physical entities whose evolution actually obeys Hamilton's equations once they've been properly interpreted. So if you've got a harmonic oscillator, like a pendulum or something like that, if you interpret the variables of Hamilton's equations in the right way, you find that uh, these systems satisfy Hamilton's equations, then you call that system a model of Hamiltonian mechanics. 
I'm going to try not to go too much into the physics of this kind of stuff. I'm going to keep it very general, but that's roughly the idea that's going on. Now, another piece of terminology, given two structures, M and N, if M is the subset of N, and if everything that is true of M is also true of N, then we say that M is an elementary substructure of N, and that N is an elementary extension of M. So it can be the case that you can have a larger model or a smaller model, uh, which has exactly the same collection of true facts about it as, as a, another given model. So that's going to be very important. Uh, now we're, I'm ready to kind of present to you this, this lohenheim skolem theorem, which is going to do the legwork for me to show that uh, numerical quantities don't have any fundamental numerical grain. So this theorem basically says that in a particular logical system, so in first order logic, uh, given any signature, uh, we've got this theorem that uh, for any infinite structure of that, of that signature, if we've got any other infinite cardinal number, then there exists a structure of the of that car, of, of size kappa, this, this higher infinite cardinal number or, or other infinite cardinal number, such that n is elementarily equivalent to m. So it might be the case that n is larger or smaller than m, uh, depending on which infinite cardinal kappa happens to be. But it's always the case that for every such kappa, there exists uh, such an n that has all the same true facts as m. Now, for those who are not familiar with, with model theory or, or first order logic, this might be a bit confusing. So I'm going to spell it out in a more intuitive way, which basically says, given a sigma structure M, the collection of facts about M cannot be used to determine the size of M, provided it's infinite. So thus axiom schemas allow for models with arbitrary cardinalities, arbitrary infinite cardinalities. So the key fact about Lo the lohenheim skolem theorem is that models uh, is that axiom schemas can never contain information about the size of their models unless their models are finite. And this is the fact that's gonna do the legwork for me in a moment to kind of talk about uh, the numerical resolution of physical quantities. So how does this inform us about numerical grain? Well, the first thing we need to know is what a quantity actually is. I'm gonna do this uh, kind of operationally. So an operational theory is kind of a shell of a scientific theory. It has no supposed ontology. We're not gonna presuppose any laws of nature, nothing like that. None of the rich details that make a scientific theory kind of what it is. Really all we're gonna look at are the, the bare collection of predictions associated with operational procedures within a theory. So the language of an operational theory is the language of tasks in the lab. It's a language of preparations, measurements, that kind of stuff, measurement outcomes. Rather than speaking about objects for which a quantity has a determinate value, we speak about a preparation for which a quantity may be measured. So the idea is you start by preparing some sort of system, you apply a measurement procedure to that system, and then you observe an out, uh, some outcome. Some, some numerical value comes out on your detector and you can read that value off. And then your theory has predictions about which values you're likely to read off given certain preparations under certain measurement conditions. So every scientific theory has an associated operational fragment. So to speak in operational terms is not really to deny any ontological commitments. It's really just a cautionary step. So we're gonna take this cautionary step. Now, operationally, a quantity is something associated with a particular kind of measurement procedure. For example, the position of a particle in one dimension is given by a particular number. Uh, typically, we think of it as a real number. Uh, this number is revealed by measuring the particle in a certain way. And operationally, in order to measure the position of a particle, we have to first carry out some sort of preparation procedure that sets up the particle to be measured in the first place. So generally, a quantity Q may be viewed operationally as a measurement procedure that takes in the state of some preparation procedure P and outputs the value, uh, some value in some number system N. So that is Q can be written as this function from P to N. And then the numerical resolution or the grain of Q is then quantified by the size and the order structure of N. Typically we take N to be the real numbers. However, it could in principle be any sort of uh, number system of arbitrary cardinality. Now, even though general scientific theory, so, okay, here, here's a bit of a problem that one might encounter. I'm talking about representing uh, physical quantities and I'm talking about using this lohenheim skolem theorem to kind of show that there's no fundamental fact about the numerical grain of these quantities, one might be worried 
that the Lohenheim Skolem theorem only, uh, as, as stated, only applies in first order logic, uh, but clearly general scientific theories are gonna be too complicated to be axiomatized in first order logic. Typically, in, especially in mathematical physics, you'll encounter structures that require like second order axiomatizations and all sorts of complicated topology and, and crazy stuff like that. Um, so it might not be very convincing for me to, to make an argument that's based off of something in first order logic and say that it applies to arbitrary scientific theories. However, and this is the broader research program that this work is connected to, um, it can be actually shown that models of operational theories can be canonically expressed as models in quantified modal logic. So this particular logical system that's not the same thing as first order logic, it's got additional structure to it, um, but it's this particular logical system. And what I, I've shown for certain op quantum operational theories is that you can actually uh, canonically translate operational theories into models of this particular logical framework. And importantly, there exist versions of the lohenheim skolem theorem that do what we need them to do in this particular logical framework of quantified modal logic. So this is kind of uh, an important fact that, that allows me to make very general statements about this stuff. Okay, so when a model of an operational theory is translated into a model of some axiom system in quantified modal logic, the resulting model will scale with the size of the number system in which quantities take on their values. So the size of the number system is very closely connected to the size of the model. Now, I'm leaving out some details here about how that connection works out, but it, it does sort of work out and it should hopefully make sense that it would work out because the number system is part of the constitutive model of the theory. Right, so under what conditions is the numerical grain of a quantity fundamental? Well, for the numerical grain of a quantity Q to be fundamental, it must play a structurally significant role in the theory. Specifically, the number system N into which it takes values must be uniquely determined by the structure of the theory, where the theory is understood as an axiom schema in this syntactic framework. So now we're in a good position. So what the lohenheim skolem theorem tells us is that so long as this number system is infinite in size, there can never be any structural features of the theory uh, with this quantity Q that singles out the size of N, because uh, there, there can no, be no uh, facts derivable from the axioms of that theory that tell us anything at all about the size of its models. In this way, the numerical grain of a quantity Q is overdetermined because you can always, given any model in which this quantity takes on values, you can always construct other models in which uh, this numerical system is arbitrarily larger or smaller as long as it's still infinite. Uh, and, and all of these options are going to be equally viable. They, they all have exactly the same facts about them that are true. So there's nothing about the axioms that they satisfy that can be used to differentiate between them. Between us, no choice of, of this number system N can be picked out simply by looking at the features of the quantity in the theory. Then the conclusion that follows from this is that there is no fundamental resolution to physical quantities in operational theories, at least on a syntactic view of theories. So, so that's kind of the, the main idea that I, I want to try and convince you of. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's everything from me. <laughs>